Act just broke with 40 years of American foreign policy by having a phone call with the leader of Taiwan, which the U.S. doesn't officially recognize. Blunder, or did he just expose a fiction? Christian Amanpour is here to analyze. Plus, will Trump slash Brexit-style anti-globalism sweep Europe? Two closely watched elections tomorrow in Austria and Italy will tell us a lot. I'll speak to the first foreign politician to meet the president-elect, the Brit behind Brexit, Nigel Farage. Plus, Ronald Reagan won two presidential terms by huge landslides. So Greenfield say Trump is poised to have a bigger impact on American politics despite losing the popular vote. Also, right here in Philly, an unusual participant, an ascot-wearing city employee, an attorney. Should he be fired? And ESPN's Stephen A. Smith said on this program that blacks were being taken for granted by Democrats. And that was before Donald Trump said to African Americans, what do you have to lose? Stephen A. is also P.O. that Colin Kaepernick didn't vote. But first, it was just a phone call, but it rang some alarm bells around the world yesterday. The president-elect took a congratulatory call from Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen. Trump has vowed to redefine U.S. international relations, but does this kind of move endanger stability? Joining me now to discuss, Christian Amanpour, CNN's chief international correspondent and, of course, the host of CNNI's nightly interview program, Amanpour, former leader of the U.K. Independence Party, Nigel Farage, who helped spearhead the Brexit revolt and Senator Chris Coons, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Christian, let me begin with you. Do you think that this was planned? Do you think that Donald Trump knew what he was doing, wanted to send a message to the Chinese, or was it a blunder? Well, the truth of the matter is I don't know whether it was planned. I'm not sure that anybody outside the two principals know that. But here's the real question. Was it uh, just a phone call? And it certainly is an unusual precedent to set. Or does it signal something different? And that would be a shift of U.S. relationship with the second most important country in the whole world, which is China. And I think what you have to look out for is the following. What will China do? So far, they've done what they have to do, and that is lodge an official protest in a call to the White House. And the White House has responded by saying, you know, business as usual, politics as usual, our bilateral relationship as usual. And just to sum that up, the relationship is one in which China uh, is the main China for the United States. Taiwan is not officially recognized by the United States. But, as you know, the United States is committed to defending Taiwan if ever it was to come under an invasion from China. So that is the basic bottom line here. So what will China do now? Next, if anything, what is Donald Trump's intention as president towards China and Taiwan? And does Donald Trump have business in Taiwan that may or may not have fully briefed and, and fully knowledgeable about these issues? Uh, on an ongoing basis, regardless of who's on the other end of the phone. He takes information that is given to him and provided to him. He avails himself of any number of different information sources, including those that come from the state. Christian, you have your fingers on the pulse all over the globe. Here's what I most want to ask you on this issue. How do you think that this is being interpreted in capitals around the world? Well, look, you know, uncertainty is something that the foreign policy establishment doesn't really like. Uncertainty is something that can lead to, you know, a little bit of chaos, if I could put it in that sort of euph euphemism. So people, frankly, around the world are simply not sure what to expect. This is a completely unprecedented situation as as president-elect. So, yes, this phone call was... A, a precedent buster. It is the first time, apparently, that a U.S. president or president
elect has spoken officially to the president of Taiwan. And this is policy that date back, dates back to Nixon going to China in 1972, and then it was finalized by Carter in all that we haven't talked about, is a call that was made between President-elect Trump and President Duterte of the Philippines, in which, according to right. Duterte's uh, readout, <laughs> and we haven't seen the Trump readout, according to Duterte's readout, he says that Donald Trump uh, spoke very kindly about some of the most controversial policies that Duterte is carrying out, and that is his anti-drug campaign, which is basically leaving bodies stacked up in vigilante and extrajudicial killings all over the Philippines. And this has been roundly condemned by the United States, uh, by the United Nations, by human rights groups, by the Asia-Pacific group, basically by everybody. And Duterte has been very, very undiplomatically rude about the United States, threatening to break off with the United States, threatening to go into a whole new world order led by China and Russia. So all this to say that there are so-called strong men who are in power around the world now who have their own ideas about which way they want to see the world go. And that may entail trying to upend the, uh, the, the alliances, the, the basic sort of foreign policy situations that we've been seeing over the last 40, 50 years. And that is what and where the uncertainty lies right now. Thank you so much, Christian Amanpour, for the big picture view on which we always come to you. The surprise victory of Donald Trump seems less surprising if viewed as part of the global global populist movement, including last June's Brexit vote for the UK to exit the European Union. Joining me now, the first face after his election, UK independence parties. The yeah. question for you, what's the common denominator of this global movement? The fact that people have lost the democratic right to control their own futures. Italy tomorrow is a Eurozone member. Uh, it finds itself unable to devalue competitively as it used to do on, you know, under the lira. Uh, we've now seen uh, 20 years of growth, 20 years with no growth at all in Italy. So, so whether it's the Euro, whether it's Mrs Merkel inviting unlimited numbers of migrants and then expecting other European states to share the numbers, this is about taking back control. Brexit was a vote for us to say, yeah, we can be friendly with Europe, we can trade with Europe, but we want to govern our own country. And I have to say uh, that I think the momentum of this is now pretty much unstoppable. Is the special relationship that the United States enjoys with the UK in jeopardy? As you well know, you paid a call. You were the first foreign leader to pay a call on, on President-elect Trump. Uh, he then sent out a tweet, which I want to... put up on the screen and remind everybody he thought that you'd be a great pick to be the ambassador the British ambassador to the United States to positively influence the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom well I think Obama's time he looked to Merkel he looked to the European Union and, and he, you know not to us as an independent country so post Brexit we got a chance to start all over again with a president in Trump who is Anglophile he is pro-British you know he knows the things that we've shared together over the years the good and the bad uh, the tough times um, as well as the good and I think that I just happen to know a few people in his administration Administration. I've clearly got um, Trump's confidence, and, and I want us to move as quickly as we can outside of Europe. Uh, and that Britain can manage just nicely. No longer do we have do a president see, who says that we're at the back of the line. Do you see for yourself... ...role in the next four years? Do you know, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but what I will say is I would like, formally or informally, to do whatever I hate in the aftermath, and how much is being drawn by immigration and concerns over open borders? 
Well, in the north of Europe, it's being driven by immigration, and in the south of Europe, it's being driven by people being stuck inside a currency, which, as I said earlier, they cannot devalue, um, and they've got no control over interest at their own tax rate. So it's both. But the common denominator is that people have lost their democratic rights of self-government. You know, they're not able to make their own decisions that affect their futures. I mean, I promise you, this European Union is dying before your eyes. I can't tell you how long it will take, but basically, it's finished. How do you maintain the proper balance of protecting one's sovereignty while at the same time being exposed to all the positive influences of globalization? Well, if we very quickly move to a US-UK free trade deal, that shows that wanting nation-state independence and democracy isn't turning your backs on the world, it's just being able to make your own decisions. And, and I think that, you know, had Hillary won this election, you know, she wanted the European Union to be a prototype for a bigger model across the whole of the world. That is now, because you want to govern your own country, does not make you insular, does not make you small-minded. Nigel Farage, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Joining me now from the great state of Delaware, United States Senator Chris Coons, whose committee assignments include foreign relations. Senator, let me go back and talk about Taiwan. Of what significance do you think the telephone call that is leading the news today? Well, Michael, we'll have to see whether this is uh, the beginning of a new chapter where the president-elect, uh, after he's inaugurated, uh, conducts a foreign policy that is uh, shoot from the hip, uh, Twitter storm style, where he gets into uh, Twitter fights or takes uh, unscheduled calls from foreign leaders in ways that break with decades of precedent like this. Congratulations. Uh, from uh, the president of Taiwan, uh, or whether he relies on the advice of career professionals in the State Department uh, and makes moves in a sort of calculated and thoughtful way. What we know from the campaign, Michael, is that President Tr President elect Trump uh, promised that he would shake things up, uh, and he made a number of concerning or even alarming proposals uh, during the campaign about uh, reconsidering our commitment to NATO, uh, rethinking our commitment to provide uh, a nuclear umbrella to South Korea and Japan, uh, and that set the foreign policy policy elites at Twitter. Uh, I do think the folks who voted for Trump um, aren't concerned by whether he takes a call from this leader or that leader, uh, but I do think this particular call, um, because it breaks with nearly four decades of precedent um, and certainly will concern, even alarm, uh, one of the most uh, powerful and important countries in the world with whom he will have to deal closely, um, is concerning, because uh, it may show the direction he's going to go as president. Um, this may make for great reality TV, uh, but it doesn't make for great leadership uh, in a divided world where there's a lot of conflicts that we have to manage carefully. You made reference to his, uh, his Twitter account. Let me put on the screen something that he tweeted. And I want to ask Senator Coons, in this instance, on called me, uh, you know, I didn't call her, but go to the second tweet and let me show Senator Coons what he said. Interesting how the U.S. sells Taiwan billions of dollars of military equipment, but I should not accept a congratulatory call. Isn't he right in saying that? Well, what he's ignoring uh, is that there is this carefully balanced situation uh, with the Chinese where we publicly accept the one China policy. We do not have uh, conversations or meetings between the President of the United States and the elected President of Taiwan, yet we still, uh, under our law, uh, provide them with uh, defense equipment, with uh, military aid. Um, that is a very delicate balance. And so, um, while it seems to make common sense to the average person that, you know, he can just take a congratulatory call. Um, this is the case with diplomacy and with world relations. There are many different situations in the world uh, where over decades we've settled into a sort of carefully calibrated situation. Uh, and this is one where, you know, the civil war of China uh, decades ago led to two countries, uh, Taiwan and China. And from 1979, the United States has recognized the People's Republic of China. Uh, and our policy has been to say it is one China. Um, so he has set that uh, a little bit on its ear. Uh, and and we'll have to see what the consequences are in U.S.-China relations. Senator Coons, thank you as always. We really appreciate thank your you. perspective. Thanks, Mike. What do you think? Tweet me at Smirconish. I'll read some during the course of the program. As a matter of fact, here we go. Smirconish, you are dealing with the ignorance of a privileged frat boy on diplomatic matters. Oh, oh, oh what? I'm the one who took the call from the uh, Taiwanese uh, president? I mean, come on. Give me a...
give me a break. Put up another one. I love the tweets. Uh, no one really gets to tell the president who he gets to talk to. U.S. defends Taiwan. Well, Kay, there is some hypocrisy among the criticism. As I was just pointing out with, with Senator Coons, I mean, we do trade billions of dollars of weaponry and military intelligence, and yet we then say, oh, you can't take that telephone call. Still to come, what a story. A lawyer for the city of Philadelphia captured on surveillance video toting wine and watching another man spray F. Trump on the side of an upscale grocery store. Should he lose? And ESPN's Stephen A. Smith on the role of the black vote.